Hi everyone, Stepan here. In today's video, I'm going to be covering the symmetrical English, the last video in the, in the series on the English opening and probably the most complex and most important one, because we are looking at a series of positions that all fall under one single name, the symmetrical English, and that's extremely unjust and makes things way more complicated. So I'm going to try to explain this in a way that uh, simplifies the possible transpositions and the possible thematic positions that could arise after c4, c5 by black. Once again, uh, excuse the hand, uh, people have emailed me, messaged me and asked me to explain. <clears throat> I burned my hand. I'm going to explain w when it gets better. Uh, not for now. In any case, the symmetrical English is black's attempt for symmetry in some cases, but in, in other cases, black plays for something completely different. Before I start explaining the actual variations, I'm going to divide uh, the symmetrical English into several parts. The first type of position we're going to be looking at is what you can see on the screen now, and this is what I called symmetry. So this is black's attempt to copy white's moves and basically have an equal position. Now, since white is a tempo up, uh, in most cases, white is going to be able to decide uh, what happens in the position next, but black has um, a huge variety of choices and possible types of positions they could play. So that's part one, symmetry. I've divided that into several different chapters, five chapters, and I'm going to explain each one. The second type of position is the Marozzi bind for white. Now, since c4, c5 uh, is an opening in which both sides move their c pawn out quickly, that means that whenever one side plays d4, or in black's case, d5, there may be an exchange with a transposition to a Sicilian type of position. So in this case, white is playing the Marozzi Sicilian Basically, black doesn't have a C pawn, white doesn't have a D pawn. Okay, uh, another example of that could be the, the reverse Marozzi. So black is doing the same thing. In this case, white had played, uh, black had played D5, white had taken, and after the exchange, black has pawns on C5 and E5, and we basically get a reverse Sicilian. Uh, the last very, very important type of position is the Hedgehog versus the Marozzi. Now, again, we are deep into Sicilian territory. In most Sicilians, white isn't going to have a bishop on g2, but it's actually favorable to have the bishop on g2 uh, against the Hedgehog in the Marozzi bind, in my opinion, because otherwise your bishop is stuck on e2 and doesn't really have influence along the along diagonal. So the fourth type of position is the Marozzi bind versus the Hedgehog. And we could say that the fifth position is the Hedgehog for black, because white doesn't necessarily have to play an e4 position. So the Hedgehog, if you've seen any of my my videos uh, against the Sicilian is a very flexible and slow developing scheme for black in which black aims to play d5 or, or b5 and break through the center and have an advantage. People have long considered this to be a two result game where white has more space, therefore white is better. But in Grandmaster play, it was proven that the hedgehog is extremely hard to crack. Okay, the final type of position <clears throat> we're going to be talking about is the Botvinnik system in reverse. White doesn't play the Botvinnik system usually after the symmetrical English, although it is possible to do so, but black sometimes, sometimes does that. So we have pawns on g6, e5, d6, c5, the bishop is on g7, the knight is on e7, the other knight is on c6, there's a hole on d5. So Botvinnik system in reverse. So those are the positions <clears throat> that we have to understand conceptually. Of course, it would help uh, to have some experience in the Sicilian with either color, because it's highly likely you'd have seen these positions before. But even so, even if you don't play e4 as white and don't play the Sicilian as black, if you play the English or if you plan to play c5 against the English, you have to understand these five positions. It's weird to sign things with this hand, but okay. Uh, so, so that's it. Those are the positions that we have to understand conceptually. As I go through the lines, <clears throat> 
Uh, I would like you to think about them and think about the general themes I'm mentioning because it's going to make uh, things much easier to understand. Now, before I get into the actual theory, I would like to take, thank the sponsor of today's video, Chessbook. Chessbook is a very useful tool that helps you work on your opening repertoire. It's as simple as that. It's intuitive, it's easy to use, it's easy to understand, and it's very, very helpful. So here's what you can do with it. You can import your repertoire. That's part one. You, you can either do that by hand. So let's say I go to my black repertoire. I want to edit something else and I want to do another variation of the Karakhan. Let's say I play the Karakhan. Let's say they go d4, I go d5 and I want to go for the fantasy. Okay, so here I play the move queen b6. White usually goes knight c3. I take on e4, they can take with the knight or with the pawn, but let's say here, and I go e5, okay? This is what I want in my repertoire. Knight f3 is the main move. I take on d4, they can take with the queen or with the knight. I can keep going, obviously, but I just wanted to show you. Chessbook is going to show you the plans. It's going to show you the ideas. It's going to explain the moves, and then you can save the moves to your repertoire. Now, once you save the moves to your repertoire, there are a couple of things you can do you can practice those moves or you can work on the mistakes from your online games. So what does that mean? I've connected my training leeches account. Okay. And here, since I imported a new variation, it found a new mistake. I haven't imported the fantasy so far. So what I can do is I can review that mistake that it found. Okay. Oh no, it was a mistake from the English. Never mind. It wasn't a fantasy. So it basically finds the mistakes from your games based on the repertoire you, you've imported and it quizzes you on those mistakes. Other than that, you can practice the moves from your repertoire daily. It will test your repertoire. So this is the video on the symmetrical English. So what I did, instead of importing my white repertoire by hand, I've simply done this import, selected the PGN of the entire study for this video, you can find it in the, in the description below. And that is now my white repertoire. So my white repertoire on Chessbook is the symmetrical English. And then I can select practice moves and let's say everything that's due for review. And it's going to ask me about my repertoire. Okay. So you have two responses. Okay. I played, must have played D4 in some variation in the video doesn't matter so it's going to test me further okay so g3 i've also played knight c3 i've also played knight f3 okay it quizzes you on all of your moves okay i want to go bishop g2 uh i'm gonna go knight c3 and now i'm gonna go knight f3 okay on knight h6 my plan is to go h4 this is the closed uh symmetrical line with knight h6 it's quizzing me on this one which is strange now i can go d4 or d3, or I can take on g6, which isn't too good. Let's say d4. d3 is another move. Takes is another move. So that's what it does. It helps you import your repertoire. It helps you practice your repertoire by actually going over random lines. It's not going in order. If you've seen the video, you know that I haven't started with knight h6. That's helpful. And then if you make a mistake, it's going to focus on those mistakes. If you would like to check out chessbook.com, you can find a link in the description. I think it's extremely useful. The basic version uh, only allows you to import a couple of hundred moves. And I'm only using the basic version here for this video. But the premium version allows you to do unlimited moves, which is obviously what you want to do if you're a serious chess player. It's about $5 a month or 4 if you get a yearly plan. Uh, I'm going to be using it. I don't think it's much. If you would like to support them, go ahead and follow the link in the description. Thank you for watching the ad. Uh, back to the video. Bye. We are going to start <clears throat> by looking at the symmetrical lines. Now, there are many ways to reach this symmetry. After c4, c5, white can start with g3, knight f3, knight c3. Those are the three main moves. I've chosen to use g3, same as in the previous video, as the main weapon, uh, because it's 
at least for me the most comfortable way to play i should mention that there is a possibility for white <clears throat> to play knight f3 on move two and play for the early d4 now in most cases after g3 that's going to transpose to a type of catalan and without g3 or with g3 it's going to be a tarash or a semi tarash so playing knight f3 and d4 is not in the nature of the english opening so we're not going to be going over those lines one more thing i should mention in order to understand the, the symmetrical english fully you basically have to be able to play all types of positions and all openings from the king's indian to the benoni to the sicilian uh it, it's just it, there's everything here so knight f3 we're not going to look at uh, we could start with g3 or knight c3 doesn't really matter leads to the same type of position so we reach our symmetry this way black copies what white is doing if white had gone knight c3 black could have gone knight c6 or, or mixed up the move order doesn't really matter the point is we reach this position knight c3 knight c6 and white starts knight f3 this is the start <clears throat> and there are five main moves for black uh, d6 e6 e5 knight f6 which is the complete symmetry and knight h6 we're gonna start with the move d6 okay d6 is in my opinion uh the best move for black which is why i've decided to start with it it's extremely uh solid it doesn't give away what black is trying to do after a possible d4 you reach a type of dragon position sicilian dragon position uh, it's keeping d4 under control so you're not blocking the d4 square by playing knight f6 therefore making d4 almost unplayable and in some lines uh that means that if white does play d4 if black wishes to play d5 and go into a sort of tarash so with c4 d4 c5 d5 black will have lost the tempo in order to do that so d6 uh makes d5 less palatable but it is the most flexible move okay white castles and now black has several options at his disposal i'm going to show you uh all of them basically okay starting with the weirdest move which is queen d7 and queen d7 may seem strange but this is a setup you have to know if you play the english this move protects the knight it's as simple as that and black wishes to go for a double fianchetto with b6 and bishop b7 but it does allow white a ton of counterplay on the queen side remember white's usual play in the english with this bishop on the long diagonal is to cause trouble on the queen side so by the time black manages to go his with his queen d7 b6 bishop b7 white will have broken through on the queen side and gained the space advantage i'm not saying this is bad for black it should be almost equal but it's strange so for example d3 b6 there are other moves uh, you could go different ways but queen d7 leads to the position i'm i'm going to show you so bishop d2 protects the knight bishop to b7 and a3 aiming to play uh, b4 at at some point let's say black goes e6 we go rook b1 we want to go b4 and once we go b4 we are sort of happy okay b4 and we've achieved what we wanted now black doesn't have to go e6 black can go knight f6 or knight h6 for example preparing to play knight f5 we still go rook b1 and i honestly don't think queen d7 is a problematic move to face now another move we have to briefly talk about is bishop d7 with a pretty uh, similar idea so after d3 uh black could go for b6 and bishop to b uh, sorry not for b6 and bishop to b7 but uh because the bishop is on d7 but you still protect the knight you avoid some trouble and black has the additional option to go for an exchange of light squared bishops so bishop d7 prepares to develop uh the bishop to the c6 square if need be if for example knight d4 is played but it also allows this and i'm going to show you the key idea behind bishop d7 so that you're not confused if you meet it over the board queen c8 and whatever white does uh black wants to go bishop to h3 the only way to prevent an exchange is to go to e1 
and after bishop to h3 to go bishop h1 and now there's one justification of this whole maneuver and neglecting kingside development by playing g3 white had create, created a hook uh, and something for black to attack so now black can continue h5 and i think this is fairly interesting if white wishes to avoid a trade of light squared bishops then black may as well uh, punish rook e1 and bishop h1 which definitely isn't a useful move by playing h5 and aiming to advance with h4 and open up uh, the h file for the rook okay uh, so these two moves i would say are the strangest ideas uh, normal ideas include knight f6 which will lead to a position with complete symmetry that we cover uh, in chapter 4 of this video, so I'm not going to go over that. We always punish complete symmetry by playing d4, and we have a slight edge, a slight uh, advantage in the game, and that's the only way for play to play for an advantage. Uh, we do, however, risk transposing to the king's Indian defense, so after d4, if black doesn't take this, we're basically uh, very close to a king's Indian uh, very very close uh, other moves that i would like to mention are knight h6 which is slightly awkward but we can exploit the positioning of this knight by playing d4 once again now since the rook isn't on h1 anymore knight h6 isn't as bad as it seems i'm going to show you a line where black plays knight h6 on move 5 where white hasn't castled yet so white can continue with h4 and trying to double attack that knight with the rook and the bishop but since white had castled already it's not as useful we can however punish this the same way we would punish knight of six we go d4 and after cd4 we can now take on h6 okay if the c3 knight is taken we take on g7 and win so bishop h6 and now knight takes d4 and after knight takes d4 uh i believe white has a slight edge despite having uh given up the bishop pair so black really should continue bishop d7 saving the pawn and now c5 is the key idea and after dc5 which is pretty much forced we can now exchange everything on c6 and after the exchange we have a better pawn structure uh we're down a pawn but i think white should hold a slight advantage because these two pawns are definitely not worth as much as the b pawn or the e pawn so that's the way to punish knight h6. I, I don't think uh, that's a move we have to worry about too much. Alternatively, bishop f5 is possible. Same as bishop g4. I don't think that's something to worry about too much. After d3, let's say queen d7. Again, they could go for bishop h3 uh, at some point. But we can now go knight d5, maybe knight f6, bishop d2, fairly standard. Now you cannot uh, win the b2 pawn because the c6 knight is hanging. So usually black is going to castle here. Uh, if, if the knight is taken, then we get a position like this. Where I believe white is much better because of this pawn. Uh, it splits black's, black's position in half. So bishop f5 is just a normal developing move and you can continue with bishop d2 and, and knight d5 seems seems fairly easy to play. Uh, the same can be said about e6. With e6 we are sort of going into the next chapter so I don't want to talk about that too much. I would like to focus on the move e5 and what black is trying to do here black is either trying to play a reverse botvinnik system so if black goes knight g7 and castles and and bishop e6 and f5 that's sort of the botvinnik system or black can try to use the fact that white did not play e4 and does not intend to play e4 and get a sort of reverse marozzi bind so after e5 white again goes for the queen side plan of preparing b4 so we go a3 now black doesn't have to play a5 but i think white should play black should play a5 uh, if knight g7 uh, not playing a5 then we can go b4 and after castles we can now go to b1 i should mention that something like this is never really a good idea this is according to the engine plus 1.4 after bishop a3 
So white usually has this sort of Benko idea of giving up the A pawn. So you can see like plus 1.4, even alternatively, if you go d4, you're still better. After bishop a3, the knight drops back and we just get pressure on d6. So this is a pattern you should remember. So if, <clears throat> if knight g7 is played, then we can basically play b4 for free and black should castle. And now we go rook b1 defending and we want to expand. If an exchange ever happens, we're happy. So after a3, I believe... Black should play a5. And now, as I said, black wants a reverse Marozzi bind, so black is going to try to go d5. Now, as white, we shouldn't really go uh, e4 at any point. I think that kills our chances. But there's a maneuver that we're going to be seeing throughout many of these variations, which starts with knight e1. So you're trying to fight for the d5 square. And if you're in time, to finish the maneuver, you go knight e1, knight c2, and knight e3, and knight d5, then d5 cannot be played. In most cases, black can force through uh, d5. However, in most lines where black has played a5, there's a weak b5 square to play with, and white should still hold a small edge. That being said, if you do manage to play knight e3 before d5 is played, then black should be strategically much worse. So we start knight e1, and black really needs to go for d5. Okay, so bishop e6, preparing d5. We go d3, have to save the pawn. This doesn't allow us to go knight c2. Okay, knight g7, playing for d5. We go knight c2, and we need one more move. So if black castles here, then knight e3 and the position is wonderful, but black plays d5. And after d5, cd, knight d, knight e3, we're still fighting for the d5 square, and we still, we still have the b5 square to play with, but d5 was played, therefore black has a fairly standard Marozzi bind Sicilian in reverse. White is playing the Sicilian defense, that much is obvious. White can still go for a hedgehog setup with something like queen c2, bishop d2, or b3, queen c2, bishop b2. Uh, white should at some point try to force through d4, if possible, and black is going to continue f5 and, and so on. So I think d6 in this symmetrical variation and following that up with e5 and forcing through d5 before white can react to it is the most interesting way to play the symmetrical English. And I, I don't want to give away too much about my repertoire, but this is one thing that I'm going to be aiming to get in my tournament games as black. Now as white, I don't see it as a big issue, but I don't have a lot of experience in the Sicilian. And if I can get a Marozzi bind a tempo down, I'm extremely happy. Okay, uh, moving on to the next position, we're going to be looking at e6 on move 5. Now, this is something completely different to the, to the first chapter we saw, because white, uh, black doesn't aim to go e5, d5. Black wants to go e6, d5, and there's a developing scheme that's extremely useful. Now, this was employed by Bobby Fischer. And there are quite a few of his games where he uses this. But at, at the time, this wasn't really well-known theory. There weren't that many books written about this. So some people call this the Fisher variation or the Fisher system. The idea is uh, what you would like to do is knight g7 and d5 and b6, bishop b7. And you get this double fianchetto position with pawns on b6, c5, d5, and e6. And that's extremely flexible. And every single piece is very naturally placed. Many people consider this to be the best weapon against the English opening. As I've mentioned previously, I've been through pretty much all the books written on the English in the last 30 years. And in many cases, this is considered to be a great weapon for black. And the engine... Uh, think so too. Black is equal in, in most cases. So let's see. White should castle, although it is possible to go d4. I should mention that possibility. If d4, c, d4, there's the possibility to go knight b5 and black continues d5. I honestly don't think there's any hope for an advantage here for white. Uh, this line is pretty much forced. cd5, queen a5 check, winning the knight. 
and now knight d2 and we're gonna exchange some pieces i don't think this is good enough for an advantage if you turned on the engine it says plus 0.6 but in many lines i've seen previously uh, i've seen when i was preparing this video and went much deeper black just manages to equalize so i think the way to fight against this is to actually castle and to allow what what black is trying to do so we castle and we go d3 we also could have gone d3 on the previous move no difference there so knight g7 black completes the setup d3 castles okay bishop d2 again white wants to go rook b1 a3 and b4 and blast through the queen side that's the main idea okay and black continues d5 now there's an option to go queen c1 here and exchange the dark squared bishops and sort of dampen the effect of black's bishop pair that's coming in a bit when b6 bishop b7 is played but i don't think that's ambitious it's sort of playing for equality which isn't something you want to do with white that being said the main line i'm about to show you with a3 is according to the engines equal or even slightly better for black but white has better winning chances because there are more active ideas so if you go queen c1 i feel like that's very passive so b6 you go bishop h6 they go bishop b7 you exchange and then the idea is to take on d5 and after d5 it takes on d5 knight d5 you go rook d1 and I, i'm not convinced uh again white is playing a sicilian black is playing a very strange setup against it i i don't know what to say i would like to have this pawn on e5 ideally and i would like to still have a bishop on g7 so it seems like black has some trouble on the dark squares but not really because white doesn't have a lot of attacking pieces to do any damage with so against this fisher system or e6 system i think going for queen side play is the best idea and this is just very natural and it's what the position calls for i think if you play the english and don't go for queenside play when it seems necessary then you shouldn't play the english you need to sort of listen to your pawn chain which is why in many ways the english is a strategic opening it's not an attacking opening you you don't normally go for kingside attacks okay so white wants to go b4 Okay, black usually plays b6. Now a5 in this position isn't really played because you, you cannot go b6 then and the b5 is just terminally weak and uh, nothing can be done. So not a5, b6. You allow white to do what they want. So white's way of proving an advantage is just getting the queen side space by the time black had developed. So rook b1, uh, bishop to b7 and b4 okay now this is exchanged and black's idea here or what black usually does to prove active play in this position is to take on c4 and this is one of the rare lines i'm going to show you basically until the end i've been studying this for a long time the line seems pretty forced and in order to understand it fully i have to show you the final position so black goes rook c8 and white really needs to seize the moment with c5 creating a weakness and blasting through the queen side completely this is taken bc5 and knight a5 and of course in this position black is threatening to to win a pawn uh white plays knight b5 attacking the pawn on a7 but after rook, a, rook c5 the idea isn't to take knight a7 it's to play queen a4 attacks the knight protects the knight on b5 puts more pressure uh on the a7 pawn so in this position black has several options as you can see bishop c6 knight ec6 uh if a6 for example this should be slightly better for for uh for white because eventually we're going to grab that b pawn so the best move my conclusion is is bishop c6 and now there's this forced line of a peace exchange where white takes on a5 this knight is pinned so black is going to pick it back up rook f to d1 okay and now black takes bishop b5 rook d7 bishop a4 and bishop b4 and after rook b5 we get a position like this where 
the engine says 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 after, F, after A5. You can also, of course, win the piece back with rook B8. This is pretty much forced. Sorry, uh, rook takes A7 is also possible. Double attacking two pieces. This is also fine. So we get sort of complete symmetry and the draw. So in my opinion, if you go E6 and try to go for this setup with knight G7 and D5 and B6 and bishop B7, White really needs to play the way I just showed you. Uh, white needs to go for a very quick castles. D3, bishop d2, a3, rook b1, b4, and then c5 after the exchanges. And we need to blast through that queen side and neutralize it because otherwise I feel like black's position is easier to play. So when I play the English over the board, when my opponent plays the symmetrical way with e6, to be honest, I'm going to decide what to do based on their rating. If I'm playing somebody 2300, then I'm fine going into this complete symmetry. Okay. Uh, if they're rated 1100, then I'm probably going to do something else because I need to complicate things. Maybe this is the reason why 5e6 is considered to be a great weapon because black easily equalizes or is better if white risks too much. Okay, now let's move on to the next type of position. We're moving to the reversed Botvinnik system. This is much easier to understand. So black instead of e6 or d6 that we were just looking at plays e5. And this is a sort of caveman style play uh, that I like a lot. Uh, and I like doing this with both sides. So this prevents d4. Okay, it's as simple as that. Prevents d4 gives up the d5 square and prepares to develop using the Botvinnik system scheme. So you want to go d6, knight here, castles, your pawn breaks are f5, b5, the bishop usually goes to e6, the queen goes to, to d7. Very, very natural position. Okay, now as white, we are a tempo up, black is a tempo down in the Botvinnik system. So we're going to use that. And again, we're going to use it the same way. We're going to castle. Black plays knight g7. And now, <clears throat> again, black doesn't necessarily have to go for d5. Okay, they don't have to go for d5. However, uh, if they go d5 or b5, our center is disappearing. Black basically wants to get rid of our c pawn and have a small edge. So we're going to apply the same maneuver we saw previously. We're going to go knight e1 with the idea of knight c2, knight e3, knight d5. If we can plant this knight on d5 before d5 is playable, then we will have prevented one of black's main ideas. That being said, knight e1 immediately isn't the main move, but I, I like it as the main move because it avoids d5. So I'm going to show you what happens if knight e1 is played. Knight e1 is the third most popular move. a3 and d3 are also possible. So uh, we go knight e1. It's also possible uh, to, to play d3, as I said, but you, you lose a very valuable tempo. e4 isn't really a threat, uh, and d3 prepares our queenside play. But I think we should focus on preventing d5. So we go knight e1. Uh, black castles, for example, knight c2, d6, and you can see that they're still very far away from achieving d5, so we go knight e3. And after bishop e6, we now plan the knight on d5, queen d7, now we play d3. And <clears throat> we don't necessarily have to go for queenside play, we don't necessarily have to play a3 and b4, we can play for our central d5 square in this case. Now, black has several options. Black can exchange the light squared bishops and then fight for control over d5. For example, bishop g2, king g2, knight d5, knight d5, knight e7. That's one option. Another option is to just play very naturally and go f5. And one more is to go for b5. You go to kb8 and try to prepare b5. This is a fairly symmetrical position, so both sides have these ideas. Okay, so this is what I like as white. I like playing knight e1 and not allowing d5. Now, <clears throat> you can allow d5. a3 is the main move, and it's the main move for a reason. Now, of course, 
Black has a choice between allowing that or not allowing that uh, before pawn break. So if Black doesn't play uh, a5 here, let's say Black castles, we can actually go b4 straight away Benko style. Uh, the same pawn sacrifice I showed you previously. So b4 takes, takes, knight takes, and bishop a3. And again, if you turn on the engine, it says plus one for white. This is actually extremely good. The engine here says plus 0 0.9, okay, after knight ec6. But we still get the knight on d5. We get this tremendous pressure along the diagonal. If, well, I mean, if the a pawn queens at the end of the game, well, what can you do? For now, we have much better pieces and way more squares. You don't have to do that, though. You can play rook b1. You don't have to play b4 straight away, although I like it. But now a5 really should be played. Uh, and then we switch back to our plan of, of doing this and occupying the d5 square. However, after a3, black, I believe, should go a5 straight away to prevent this pawn sacrifice with b4. So a5. And now we switch. We go knight e1. Okay, knight e1. Fine. Black usually goes d6 here, but it's possible to castle. Uh, so d6. Okay, knight c2. Uh, they castle, but it's also possible to go bishop e6. Okay, we go knight e3. They castle, and once again, uh, we can go d5, knight d5, or we can go d3. So black has to choose. Either playing a5 to prevent a3, or not playing a5 and moving on to push through d5, but allowing the b4 pawn sacrifice. So in my opinion, there's really no downside to meeting the reverse Botvinnik with a3 on move 7. I really think this is a good idea. If a5 isn't played, we sack the pawn with b4, although black doesn't have to take it, but still. Uh, or we get, sorry, our usual knight e1, knight c2, knight e3, knight d5 maneuver in. So playing the Botvinnik system in reverse, to me, seems okay for black but you're a tempo down so white manages to occupy d5 very comfortably and white should be better okay now let's look at the copycat variation or what i called complete symmetry so in this position black simply goes knight f6 okay now <clears throat> this is very normal however white is able to gain an edge immediately and at least create a significant imbalance by playing d4. I should mention that castling first uh, can transpose to the king's indian, so if you're not comfortable with that, don't go for the king's indian, so after castles, castles. If you go d4 now, black can just choose to go d6, and we are in the king's indian. That's about it. So instead of castling, just go d4 straight away. Because now d6, of course, isn't a good move. The, if, if d6 here, we can just go d5 and get a very favorable type of Benoni, or we can take on c5 and take on d8 and misplace the knight on c6. So, in this case, cd4 really should be played. Okay, we take with the knight, and now again, we have a Sicilian defense. If white plays e4, and we can get the Marozzi bind position, which is what I would like to do as white here. Or if white doesn't play e3, I don't e4, I don't know what to call that position, but white has the d5 square, so that's good. And all of our pieces are placed well to control the light squares. Okay, both sides castle. And now there are a couple of options for uh for black. Black can play queen a5, which is a queen trade line. Uh which I really enjoy as white. I actually had a game in this position after queen a5. White goes knight b3, the queen goes to h5. This is well known from the Fianchetto King's Indian. I actually had this uh, from the Fianchetto King's Indian. Uh, e4 now by, by white and d6, and we get this queen trade. Queen takes, knight takes, and c5. Blasting through, through the center, takes, knight takes. I believe white should have a comfortable position here. I think this is slightly, slightly better for white, and I don't think white has any issues. This knight just seems strange, uh, if I'm going to be perfectly honest. And the b7 pawn seems weak, especially because this bishop is over here, so playing b6 doesn't seem like a rational idea. 
Alternatively, to, to Queen a5, Knight g4 is possible. Uh, and Knight g4 unleashes this bishop. So you basically have to defend the knight, so e3. And e3 is a concession. Uh, you, of course, don't want to go knight e3, bishop e3. You also don't want to take on c6. Uh, so it's a provocation. d6 comfortably defends the knight. And now b3, we need to sort out the bishop a different way. Knight takes. Pawn takes. Now again, if you spend a move on b3, I'm going to open up your bishop on this diagonal and say that b3 was a useless move. The knight goes to h6, bishop b2, and knight f5 puts pressure on, on d4. So knight d5 and bishop d7. And again, normal position. White, I believe, should be slightly better. Because if the e-pawn moves, the d-pawn is weak. If the e-pawn doesn't move, it in itself is weak. This bishop is obviously a monster until this bishop occupies c6. The knight on d5 seems pretty good. We have the semi-open e-file with the target in the end. I see no reason for black to, to be equal. Okay, and the main way to play against d4 in this symmetrical line is to just take uh, take the knight. Queen takes. There's no knight that could come to c6, so no downside at all. d6, okay, queen d3, uh, getting away from this from this stair of, of the bishop. Uh, a6. And black, of course, would like to go b5, bishop to d2, normal development. And at some point, white is going to play e4. We are going for a Marozzi bind versus the Sicilian. This is basically Marozzi bind versus the dragon. But for some reason, white has a bishop on g2. So rook b8 gets away from the bishop and prepares b5. Rook ac1 prepares to have an active rook after b5. Bishop f5, tempo on the queen and e4. Okay, bishop d7, we have to play against this idea of queen c8, so h3, preventing queen c8, bishop h3, because now we have king h2, and b5. And after c takes b5, a takes b5, something like b4. I, I wouldn't say black is worse, but I would say that b5 is a bigger weakness than a2, or a3 if the pawn moves forward. Uh, and I also think that liquidating this weird blockaded central pawn mass is going to be very hard so positionally i think white has an advantage we can double up the rook the rooks down the c file uh we don't necessarily have to play knight d5 but we could and we're hoping black takes it seems very comfortable so i'm not too convinced with black copying white's ideas uh until move five because white is the first one to strike with d4 and open up the center to to his advantage okay uh the last line i would like to show you in the symmetry is knight h6 on move five this is a strange move and it should be treated as a strange move this is basically basically black trying to develop the king side quickly without hindering the g7 bishop therefore keeping control over d4 and we need to punish that and the way we punish it is by using the fact that we have a rook on h1 and we just go h4 i think this is very sensible uh black continues development and we go h5 okay and now the the main move here is bishop to g4 trying to put pressure on the pawn uh and white actually has a couple of options taking on g6 is is bad more than equal for for black even though it has been played the main option is d3 alternatively you can go d4 which is a move that has never been played i never saw anybody recommend d4 uh and it was never played in master games but it's actually extremely interesting you give up a pawn or try to give up a pawn so d4 cd4 you play knight d4 and now if well you you have this going on so let, let me show you if knight takes d4 and then we can play bishop takes h6 and after bishop takes h6 we have queen takes okay or after here and knight c2 and queen c2 and bishop h6 we now have rook d1 and we have we don't have to castle, we don't have to go e4, but we have all of those ideas. And white should be close to winning. So I honestly don't understand why nobody had ever 
played this as white. I mean, it's it's a fairly simple trick, but it seems to work. Okay, so instead of blundering with knight takes d4, black plays queen d7, and this defends the bishop. So after queen d7, white can just go bishop e3, uh, defending. So knight takes d4, bishop takes d4, and e5. Now this is an engine variation, but if this is the best black could get, I'm interested in playing d4 instead of d3. I mean, the line should continue something like bishop e3 and knight f5. Ag6, Ag6, rook h8, here, here, and queen d2. And I think white's pawn structure is better. White's bishops are great. Uh, this bishop is kind of awkward. So that's just an alternative. Now, I should say that I've never seen this recommended. If you want to explore it, you can. It seemed interesting. d3 is, is the main move. And now, the trick is, if bishop h5 winning a pawn, uh, that, that doesn't really work because you play bishop takes h6. And after bishop takes h6, g4 wins a piece. That's game over. So d3 unleashes this bishop and prepares to fork black's pieces. So queen d7, okay? And queen d7 controls g4. So we can play queen g4. And now we play rook b1. We just continue with our queenside play. So black takes the pawn. Black plays bishop takes h5. We again play bishop h6, bishop h6, g4. Black can now take with the queen. But we get a ton of compensation with bishop h3. And this is considered to be a very strong pawn sacrifice for white. After something like queen f4 and knight d5, you can see that white has a ton of initiative. The engine gives this as plus 0.8 for white, almost plus 1, depending on how long you let it sit. So I think it's extremely interesting. Uh, You've given up a couple of pawns, but you have tremendous initiative. And again, personally, I'm not a big fan of stuff like this because I, I don't like giving up material, but you can see that white pieces are working well and they are well co coordinated. So punishing knight h6 with h4, h5 is, I think, the principled way to play. You don't have to do it. You don't have to go h4. You can play a normal position and you can just go either castles or d4 and you know, play play the normal English. But I think h4, h5 is, is the way to go. Okay, now for the next big thing uh, for, for black. There are many ways and many names, many ways for black to play and many names I will not mention in, in this video because they would only be confusing. There are many variations called the three knights, the four knights, the whatever knights, the, the keres, the parma, uh, many, many names for similar things. So as I said, I, I've tried to divide this video into several parts. The first part that we just went through is the symmetrical lines. The second part will be the hedgehog for black. So how can black play the hedgehog? You will find many different names and many different transpositions leading to and from the positions we are going to reach. But in order to simplify things, let's call it the hedgehog. So c4, c5. We can start with knight c3 or g3, it doesn't matter. Knight f6. Okay. Uh, g3. e6. And e6 signifies the, the black's attempt to go into the hedgehog. Black doesn't have to do it. Okay, knight f3 is the principled move. If we go bishop g2, it's possible for black to play d5 straight away, and this is just more than equal. We are in a in an unfavorable semi-tarash, I would say, or unfavorable tarash after something like this. Knight c6 and queen a4, or you can call this the c4 e5 reverse Sicilian keres variation, a tempo down for white. So not bishop g2. After e6, we will continue knight f3. And the hedgehog will begin by black playing b6. Okay, so this is what we're going to be focusing on. It's possible for black not to play b6. It's possible for black to play d5 or knight c6 or bishop e7. And those lines are most likely going to transpose to either the Tarash or the Catalan. So I'm not going to be looking at them. Black is going to go d5. White is going to be required basically to play d4. And we have the Tarash or the Catalan. So if you want to know more about that, 
look at the Karash, Tarash and the Catalan uh, videos on the channel. We're focusing on B6. Okay, now the hedgehog is this. This pawn structure, flexible bishops, rooks on c8, d8, or e8, d8, or e8, c8, black trying to play b5 or d5, and, you know, normal position. So how do we reach that, and what should white do? Well, white develops sensibly, bishop to g2, black plays bishop to b7, white castles. So what can we say about black's position? It's solid, it's, it's flexible, it resembles... Uh, the reti, of course, it's basically a reti in reverse for now. Uh, although black doesn't have to be in keto, black can play bishop e7. And there are many ways for black to play for an advantage. Most important ones are b5 and d5. Okay. So bishop e7. And white should attempt to go for e4 as quickly as possible. Okay. Uh, whatever we do as white... We're going to have to go e4 in order to prevent d5. And we have to start thinking about this position as if it were uh, a Sicilian. Because it is a Sicilian. White will have to play d4. White will have to play e4. Everything else is inferior. So you can start rook e1 or you can start d4. I prefer uh, playing uh, d4 immediately. But rook e1 is also playable. After rook e1... Black can play d6 or d5. Uh, so, I, I mean, why would we allow that? It's the reason I like d4. So let's say d6. Black plays the normal hedgehog. We're not going to be focusing on an early d5. e4. Okay, a6. d4. c takes. Knight takes. Queen c7. This is the hedgehog. Uh, we go bishop e3, black is playing, white is playing a normal Marozzi bind. And now there are a couple of options for black. You should know that queen takes c4 loses by force. This is a well-known trick that you can also see in the Sicilian many times. Uh, white doesn't have to play rook c1 before this becomes unplayable. So for example, if castles and rook c1 and queen takes, then it's easy to see why, why this is bad, because we're just going to win everything. In fact, after queen c8, we win the queen too. But it's also bad if it's taken straight away. Sorry. Uh, if it's taken straight away. After queen c4 here, we can now continue rook c1 and we are completely winning. Black doesn't have a lot of squares, either queen b4 or queen c8. If queen b4, we can just go a3. Uh, queen takes. I mean, that's the sensible move. And now knight a4. Queen takes a3. <clears throat> knight takes b6. And after castles, we don't even uh, take the rook, we go rook c7 and two pieces are hanging. Or alternatively, after, after rook c1, if queen c8, this is even worse, we just go knight c to b5 and everything is hanging. The c7 square is hanging. After, for example, knight c6, which should be the best move, we can just take. And after bishop takes, we take on d6, we check, bishop takes queen takes, this bishop is pinned and lost, the king cannot castle, black resigns. So in this position, the c4 pawn isn't really under pressure. So black either plays knight bd7 or castles. Uh, I think castles is the principal move. And we have the hedgehog versus the, the Marozzi bind. White's idea <clears throat> is to play f4 and then maybe even g4 and attack the king. Black's idea is to force through d5 or b5 and try to equalize. Now, I, I prefer playing d4 straight away because I'm not convinced that rook e1 is a useful move. Particularly because... Okay, I, I've played the Marozzi bind against the Hedgehog in probably 20 tournament games and in over... It has to be over 200 training games over the board and online. And... A rook on e1 is almost never useful, in my opinion. So you're playing a move that plays against your, your setup. It's not a bad move, but it's not as useful as having a rook on d1. Okay, so we start with d4. Okay, black takes. Uh, you can take with the queen or with the knight. Uh, taking with the queen is better, because on knight c6 you have queen f4. And this is just... A very well placed queen you have the d1 square for your for your rook and after something like castles rook d1 this is fairly natural d5 cannot be played 
d6 doesn't seem useful so after queen d4 black doesn't play knight c6 black plays d6 okay and now we go rook d1 we go rook d1 the rook is better on d1 than on e1 in my opinion okay uh, black continues plays the hedgehog fine uh, we go b3 we want to develop this bishop to b2 if possible and we're gonna go e4 supported by the queen as well knight bd7 standard hedgehog move e4 and once again we are in the hedgehog queen c7 or queen c8 are possible uh both are fine i think queen c7 is slightly more normal you can also by the way go queen b8 uh but queen c8 is the main move so so let's have a look at that they both have a similar idea of bringing something to the d file and challenging the c5 square bishop to b2 by white black castles uh queen e3 okay uh queen c7 that's possible for example knight d4 uh rook f8 is possible rook ac1 is possible rook ac8 is possible the point that i was trying to make in the last minute is that this is a slow position and nothing is going to happen until one side decides to do something active now to give you an example of active uh and to justify this move it's to prevent knight d5 in many positions uh if the c4 pawn is hanging knight d5 wins the bishop with with a bunch of checks in many positions when there is a knight on c6 instead of d7 knight d5 is just a useful knight trade because it gains the tempo on the queen and on the bishop and if you take c takes attacks the pinned knight on c6 so these are slow prophylactic moves sort of and unless black prepares d5 or b5 and unless white prepares f4 successfully nothing is ever going to happen there will be no damage in black playing uh, queen c8 queen b8 queen c7 there will be no damage in white playing rook d2 rook c2 rook d1 rook c1 rook d3 whatever it's a slow position nothing's going to happen and then one side is going to win if they lash out or they're going to lose okay so that's the hedgehog uh i've won games with f4 i've won games with a3 b4 uh i've won many games with knight d5 and i've lost many games when i allowed d5 okay now moving on let's look at one very thematic line <clears throat> called the rubinstein variation perfected by Mikhail Botvinnik in the 30s and the 40s I think he's the first uh, top player who employed this successfully not that Rubinstein was bad he was amazing but he didn't develop the theory as deeply because mostly because his opponents were sometimes playing nonsensical moves so c4 c5 again we continue with g3 we can also continue with knight c3 and transpose and now we are looking at positions where black plays knight f6 and the quick d5 now not all of them are called the rubinstein variation but the most important one is but the basic thing we we have to notice whenever knight f6 is played on move two and by the way we can transpose if they go knight f6 on move one and c5 on move two they want to go d5 black wants to go d5 and black wants to go d5 quickly okay so we go bishop g2 black plays d5 okay and now we already see after c takes d5 knight takes d5 that this is going to be an open position we can call the symmetrical copycat position closed positions and we can call knight f6 d5 positions open positions i think that's a good that's a good way to do it the way we fight against this is we go knight c3 and they go knight c7 this is the rubinstein variation this is the rubinstein move and i think it's the most uh ambitious way for black to play against the english opening out of every possible variation we've seen throughout this series i think this is the most ambitious why because black is playing e4 against the sicilian and going for a reverse marozzi bind okay nothing can stop e5 from happening unless white plays something crazy like f4 
uh, and, and E5 is going to happen. It's going to be a reverse Marozzi bind. So you can call the Rubinstein variation the reverse Marozzi bind. I think that's justifiable. So white continues knight f3 playing against E5. Okay, uh, black plays knight c6 preparing E5 and that's about it. You, you, you cannot prepare, prevent E5 anymore. White castles, E5 and D3. And now uh, we can play this several different ways. Uh, but I think the best way to play is to go for a3 and b4 very quickly. And I'm going to show you that in a bit. But d3 is the main move and it's useful. So let's have a look at that. So black plays bishop e7. We can go bishop e3 and rook c1 trying to put pressure on the pawn, but it can be defended uh, quite, quite comfortably. And I, I don't think we're getting anywhere. Uh, so knight d2. I would recommend knight d2. Putting pressure down the diagonal and maybe even preparing to ruin black's pawn structure. So black plays bishop d7. We go knight c4, putting pressure on e5, threatening to take on c6, take on e5. And now black has a choice. Uh, f6 is the most popular move, just defending the pawn. But there's an interesting pawn sec line where black can a castle and give up a pawn and actually ends up being better after knight e5 bishop e8 bishop e3 and knight e6 there have been many games where black had won this and black should have more than equality for a pawn that being said white's a pawn up and and you know if if the pieces get traded off white should win but the main move is f6 and after f6 the pawn is defended and this is actually a normal Marozzi bind move. I've had this exact position with white so many times. In this case, the, the bishop isn't on g7, it's on e7. This is where you have this bad Marozzi bind bishop. And I think this is extremely ambitious for black. It's just, it's just equal. Okay, now white, of course, doesn't have to play passively. White doesn't have to play uh, b3 and bishop b2 and a3 and queen c2 and rook d1 and so on. White has a way to fight this and I think that's the only way to try and play for an advantage and that's f4. You have to try and break <coughs> the central Marozzi bind as quickly as possible. You're using the fact that you've vacated the f3 square, you can move the f-pawn and you want to blast through the f-file before black had managed to consolidate and castle okay but black isn't stupid uh now of course ef4 is not optimal castles is not optimal black needs to counterattack and play b5 okay uh the knight retreats to e3 and now ef4 and now white has a couple of choices the idea behind b5 was to block this bishop uh, either knight d2 or knight d3 blocks the bishop so white can take on, on on f4 with the rook or with the pawn but the best move and the only move that gives white equality believe it or not black is better after the other two moves is knight f5 and knight f5 uh puts tremendous pressure on on black's position you can see that the d5 square is under white's control g7 is under pressure e7 is under pressure the f4 pawn is under pressure the rook is open uh black should continue b4 and now we take on e7 threatening knight c6 knight d8 so no time to take on c3 so queen e7 and now knight e4 looking at c5 looking at f4 uh looking at d6 very very nice i mean this is if I had to choose, I'd like to be white. The engine says it's equal, but it seems nicer for white. After knight e6, we can now take gf4. And you can see that black is risking a lot by playing f6 in this position, uh, because white can safely play the move f4. Not safely, if you're going to take gf4 in the end, it's, it's never safe. It's double-edged. But black isn't allowed into this shell uh, and security of the Marozzi bind where nothing happens and they just have more space. Okay, alternatively uh, to d3, I think it's extremely interesting to go a3. And this creates a threat of eliminating black's central pawns 
uh, by playing b4. If we play b4, then the c5 is gone. And if the c5 is gone, we can go d4. And just the, the position just blows open. So for example, uh, I, I think uh, rook b8 is absolutely forced. But bishop e7 has been played. I'm going to show you a trick. Firstly, rook b8 defends the b4 square. Okay, that may seem abstract now. But after b4 by white takes, takes, if bishop takes, in many lines, there will be queen a4 check winning the bishop after we take on e5. Because when we take on e5 and the knight takes, after queen a4 and knight back to c6, we have double pressure on c6. Okay, therefore the bishop hangs. So for example, if bishop e7 and b4 and black decides to win a pawn, if it's taken with the knight, then it's even easier. After knight c6, we go knight takes pawn. And, you know, it's just everything is falling apart. So bishop takes. But now it's still queen a4. Uh, sorry, knight e5 first. Sorry, knight e5 first. And if this is taken, if it's not taken, no problem. We win on c6. But if it is taken, then here. Okay, and after knight c6, as I said, we had double pressure on c6. We can take and take on b4. And of course, white is much better. One pawn island, perfect rook, weakness here, weakness here, black cannot castle, white is winning. So after a3, if you are going to go bishop e7, then you cannot take the pawn. After b4, uh, you go f6, for example, just defending the pawn. I think, though, after a3, you should go rook b8. And now the same variation with b4 loses for white. If, if, if b4 then takes, takes, bishop takes. And if we try to do the same thing, knight e5, knight e5, queen a4, knight c6, bishop c6, b c6, the rook defends the bishop and white resigns. So after rook b1, after rook b8, uh, white should go rook b1. And now that reinforces the same threat. It reinforces the threat of going b4. And after rook b1, black usually goes f6, just defending. And white continues normally. d3. Black plays bishop e7. White plays bishop e3, putting pressure on c5. Black continues normal Marozzi bind development. Knight e4. Okay, b6. b4. White is going to be slightly better. I mean, this is, if we're allowed to play b5 at some point comfortably, then this is a backward pawn. Uh, I would prefer to be white here because I have a bit more pressure on black's queen side. And unless black manages to successfully play something like f5, bishop f6, e4, or start a kingside attack, not too much trouble for white. That being said, it's completely equal. Okay, so only from a human perspective does it seem to me that white's position is easier to play. The engine says 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 after 95. All right, uh, the final thing I would like to look at today is something that's not uh, as important as, as what we looked at so far, but it's extremely useful. It's avoiding the Benoni and the Benko. So if you know that your opponents play the Benko or the Benoni, they like going c5, then if you play d4 and move 1, and they go knight f6, and you go c4, and they go c5, trying to play the Benko or the Benoni, you wouldn't play d5, you would play knight f3. And knight f3 is the so-called anti-Benoni. This is the anti-Benoni, so takes, knight takes. Now we can reach that from the English. So we go c4, they go c5, okay, so if d4 they can transpose to, to those lines. We go knight f3, which we never normally do, but this is if you know that your opponent plays the Benko or the Benoni. They go knight f6, and now we go d4, okay. And after cd4, we go knight d4, and they go e5. So if you want to punish... Benoni and Benko players specifically and get them out of their comfort zone. This is something they have to know pretty well. And it's extremely sharp and white's always slightly better. If instead of e5 they go e6, this is going to transpose to the Nimzo Indian 
I believe the Romanitian variation, but but I'm not sure. So for example, knight c3, uh, bishop b4, g3, castles, uh, let's say bishop g2 and d5 and cd and knight d. Okay, this is a normal limb to India. So instead of that, they, they could try knight c6, but that's again not as ambitious. We go knight c3, e6, g3, and we are in a fairly standard English where white is going to go e4 and play the Marozzi bind. So we've avoided what they were trying to play. And the only way for them to try and punish us is by gaining this tempo with e5. But that's really no big deal. Knight b5, d5, cd5, and bishop c5 is sort of the main line. Uh, knight 5 to c3, castles, and you can play e3 or g3 or both. Uh, I think in both cases, black at some point is going to advance with, with e4. I just feel this is fine. Uh, for the moment, we're a pawn ahead, but that, that pawn is probably going to disappear at some point. So let's say g3, queen b6, forcing e3, bishop g4, bishop e2, bishop takes, queen takes, e4, a3, preparing b4. Seems okay. I mean, if... This is a weapon to get the Benko and the Benoni players out of their comfort zone. I want to have it in, in my repertoire, so that's why I wanted to show you this. Anyway, that's what I wanted to go over today. Uh, this finishes the English opening series. I hope it wasn't too much to handle. Again, you can use uh, the studies. I posted on Patreon. You can find the links in the description below and chess book to, to make this easier. Uh, hopefully it does. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments below and good luck studying the English. Stay tuned for more chess. Bye bye.